From Miami Law, I'm Annette Uges, and this is The Explainer. It's a large number of people sitting next to each other for long periods of time. And that's not true when you just pop into a shop quickly to buy something and then leave. Welcome back to the Miami Law Explainer, the legal affairs podcast where Miami law experts lend context and historical relevance to today's headlines. While the U.S. is trying to manage the deadly pandemic through limiting gatherings and social distancing, some religious leaders declare that banning religious services violate their First Amendment liberties. Constitution scholar Caroline Mala Corbin walks us through the hazards. Good morning. Uh, just a note for our listeners, we are out of the studio and winging it remotely. Good morning, Caroline. Welcome back to The Explainer. Thank you for having me back. So we're seeing a few pastors around the country continue to hold mass gatherings despite local bans. Do they have a religious right to continue or should a global pandemic trump religious freedom? The first thing to note is that there actually are many states that have already carved out an exception for religious gatherings. So this is not a rule that applies across the country. That said, there are states that have banned all gatherings more than a certain number of people, including religious gatherings. Do these orders violate the religious liberty? Um, Probably not. So how would a court decide if a stay-at-home order violated religious liberty? And just to be clear, when people argue that a state ban violates their religious rights under the U.S. Constitution, they're referring to the protections afforded by the Free Exercise Clause. Okay. And under existing law, um, regulations and orders that are neutral and generally applicable do not violate the Free Exercise Clause, even if they do limit people's ability to practice their religion. Um, So... What does it mean for a law to be neutral and generally applicable? Right. What is what what does neutral mean in this case? Right. So an order is neutral if it does not target religion and it's generally applicable if it applies broadly without being riddled with exceptions. So again, focusing on the neutrality. Banning all gatherings of a certain size whether they be in schools or museums or movie theaters or restaurants or gym or houses of worship, that kind of order doesn't single out religion for disfavor. And therefore, those orders are neutral. In other words, they're not targeting religion. They apply to all mass gatherings. And that's generally a fair characterization of all these ban on large gatherings. So what is generally applicable? How does that apply here? Yeah, generally applicable, again, it means that it applies to all, everyone it should, and it's not just absolutely riddled with exemptions. So depending on the sort of number and scope of exemptions allowed, some might argue that the stay-at-home orders are not generally applicable, right? Because states often have an extensive list of exceptions for essential businesses, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and I can imagine someone making the argument that if providing takeout pizza and cannabis is an essential service, then why not worship? Right. Um, but that's assuming those activities are comparable, Right. If you're going to argue that there are a lot of comparable exceptions, then the other things against which you're comparing should be similar and they may not be. Right. Mm-hmm. So take the, 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 the takeout restaurant. Um, eating is essential. Right. <laughs> and we can't grow our own food. Right. Well, at least not all of us. But no. yes. <laughs> Worship may be equally essential. But arguably, we can pray to God on our own or online. 
And it's no or, or by phone even. So it's not even a broadband issue like I can't access my I can't watch the podcast or yeah. the video and, cast, and but I could listen to it on the phone. Most religious organizations have decided that in the interest of the safety of their congregation that they were going to be they would move their provision of religious services um, uh, it, it, to, into alternate methods. Right. So they may might not be comparable in that way. Also, right, they may not be comparable in the fact that with religious worship, it's a large number of people sitting next to each other for long periods of time. And Mm -hmm. that's not true when you just pop into a shop quickly to buy something and then leave. Right. Right. So when you're trying to argue that there are a lot of exceptions and therefore it's not generally applicable. These exceptions can be very different in kind and uh, scope. Okay. So do the churches win if they can show that the law is not generally applicable? No, because even if it's not neutral or not generally applicable, the state still wins if it can pass what's known as strict scrutiny. Mm Mm-hmm. So what, what exactly is strict scrutiny? Uh, a law passes strict scrutiny if the goal of the law is truly compelling and there's not an alternate means of accomplishing it, right? So again, the stay-at-home orders will still pass constitutional muster if they meet this strict scrutiny standard. Okay. So again, the first requirement is that the goal of the stay-at-home orders is compelling. Mm -hmm. And there's generally no goal more compelling than health and safety, generally, and certainly saving lives, right? I don't think anyone's going to quibble that these orders aren't motivated by the interest of the highest magnitude. Right. I I don't think that's an argument anyone's going to make, right? Well, or at least likely to win. (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. Right. So the outcome of a legal challenge is likely to turn on whether the government persuades the court that it can achieve this life saving mission without restricting large religious gatherings. Right. So they okay. the government it's on the government to show that it's really necessary to ban all mass gatherings, including religious ones, in order to save people's lives. Have the courts ever decided a case like this before? Um, there's there's not a modern Supreme Court case dealing with a religious challenge to a stay-at-home order. <laughs> <laughs> this is it's a first. This is new territory. Uh-huh. Um, but but the Supreme Court has uh, more than once ruled that public health may trump constitutional rights. So in 1905, for example, the court rejected a constitutional challenge, albeit not a religious liberty challenge, but a challenge to a mandatory vaccination law. So it upheld a mandatory vaccination law. And in 1944, the Supreme Court rejected a religious liberty, and this one is a religious liberty challenge, to a child welfare law. So it has said, you know, sometimes the interest in public health does trump individual constitutional rights. And there's actually a line from that case that is worth reading because the Supreme Court said the right to practice religious, the right to practice religion freely does not include liberty to expose the community or the child to communicable disease or the latter to ill health or death. And so that seems spot on. Yes. And and that is exactly the quotation that a lot of lower courts have used to uphold vaccination laws against religious challenges. So there's not something mm. directly on point, but there are cases that raise the same question on this sort of tension between individual religious liberty and the public health at risk from a um, widespread disease. Since all, all of these are in place and it's so unlikely that 
it would be fought in the courts. Can they delay? Can they continue having these mass gatherings while they're fighting them in court? Or is there a super like temporary injunction? Like, no, you can't continue doing this, even if their state is is not complying with with what the CDC and everyone else seems to think is the only way out of this morass. So generally how this would play out is that they would file for what you're calling a preliminary injunction saying, listen, even before you make a final decision, you know, we think we should win and therefore we ask you to sort of enjoin the law from being enforced. And a court okay. will be like, well, who's more likely to win? And if they think the state is more likely to win, then they won't grant the temporary injunction. And if they think the people challenging the law is more likely to win, then they may. Um, and that, again, depends on the strength of the case and sort of the, what's at stake. I mean, I can't imagine the optics of uh, dragging people out of church and into paddy wagons would be... Like good for any state, any governor. Um, nor is it good optics to have dozens and dozens of people die because they allowed a large gathering where the virus spread. And and note that many, many outbreaks have been traced to religious gatherings. Right, right. Um, well, uh, this sounds like we've got a good handle on it. Is there anything you want to add in closing? Um, yeah, I, I think it's really important to emphasize that our constitutional rights are precious. Um, and we should always be very vigilant in protecting them. But they're not absolute. Mm -hmm. No constitutional right is absolute, especially if exercising them may endanger others. Okay, strong words. Well, Caroline, thanks for being here and uh, stay healthy, my friend. Likewise. All right. Take care now. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us at The Explainer. If you love our show, leave us a five-star review with your podcast provider and ask your friends to subscribe. You can always drop us a comment at explainer at miami.edu. Our show was engineered and edited by Christopher Alzadi with theme music composed by Rady Kim from the Frost School of Music. I'm your host, Annette Uguez. Today's episode is brought to you by Miami Law's Street Law Program, an educational legal outreach program that trains current law students to teach law to high school students. For more information, visit law.miami.edu forward slash street law.